Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. I am Tilly McKenzie and in today's video we will discuss the poem Test Mat Sabina Park by Stuart Brown. So feel free to ask me any questions you may have about any aspects of this poem and share your insights as well in the comment section below. So without further ado, let's begin by reading the poem. Test Mat Sabina Park by Stuart Brown. Proudly wearing the rosette of my skin, I strut into Sabina. England boycotting excitement bravely, something badly amiss. Cricket. Not the game they play at Lords. The crowd. Whoever saw a crowd at a cricket match are caged vociferous partisans quick to take offence. England, 68 for none at lunch. What sort of batting that man? Them can't play cricket again. Perhaps them should have borrowed Lawrence row. And on it goes, the wicked slow as the batting and the crowd restless. A hey, white boy, how your brothers them does send we sleep so? Me I pay monies if you watch this foolishness? Cho. So I try to explain in my Hampshire drawl about conditions in Kent, about sticky wickets and muggy days, and the monsoon season in Manchester but fail to convince even myself. The crowd's loud busing drives me out, skulking behind a tarnished rosette, somewhat frayed now, but unable quite to conceal a blushing nationality. Okay, so let's begin analyzing the poem line by line. And remember, if you have any questions about any aspects of the poem, leave a comment or question below. So the first line of stanza one says, proudly wearing the rosette of my skin. I strut into Sabina, that's line two. So what we're getting from these two lines is that the persona, the voice in the poem, the, the voice where the conflict surrounds, which you will see as we examine the other stanzas in the poem, actually enters Sabana in a proud manner. He walks in Sabana proudly. And he says that he proudly, he's proudly wearing the rosette of my skin. Now the word rosette, rosette is actually a badge uh, that, or a badge or uh, that is usually in the form of a ribbon. And it is a, a ribbon badge whose color indicates the team you support, right? So here the person has white skin indicates that he supports the English team. So basically, um, I'm not sure about where you are, but I remember when I was in primary school, when I was in primary school, um, I was in Blue House, and then they had blue, yellow, and green. And uh, I, I, especially when we have games, they allowed us, if we were in Blue House, we would buy a piece of like a blue ribbon, and we would wear it by our, on our t-shirt to the side, right? So when persons see that, they will see that we are part of Blue House, and we are supporting Blue House. Likewise, when we consider the different teams, right, in the case of cricket, if the West Indies are playing against another team, they will have their own t-shirts or even the supporters will, you know, you buy the t-shirt to show that you're supporting a particular team. But for the person in this poem, he is not relying on any t-shirt. He's bragging and he's saying what? That he's wearing the rosette of his skin. So by looking at his skin color, you should know who is he supporting, right? So as we go to the poem, you will see that the other team is the England team and the, and the, and the team that is feeling is actually the West Indian team, okay? So the person enters Sabina Park and he notices that it says in line two that I strut into Sabina. Sabina is actually a cricket ground in Jamaica and the, the park is basically called Sabina Park, okay? So proudly wearing the rosette of my skin, I strut into Sabina. So wearing the rosette of my skin, um, the rosette there is a metaphor, right? Because the person is speaking in a metaphorical sense. He doesn't mean that he's actually wearing a literal um, rosette. He's depending on his skin color to indicate his support or where his support lies. So he enters the, the park by walking proudly and arrogantly, okay? Because it come, he enters as if he's expecting something. He enters with hope, with a feeling that his team most likely will be performing well. Now we go to start line three, which says in red, England boycotting excitement bravely, something badly amiss. Okay, so right here we see that the, the one of the team is the English team, 
and they're boycotting excitement bravely. So what the person is saying in line three is that England, which is the team playing against the West Indian team, they are boycotting excitement bravely. Now the word boycott, when you boycott something, you are conscious, consciously deciding to not participate in something. Okay, so you're removing your support to show that you disapprove of something. So as a person enters Sabina Park, he recognizes that England is refusing to bring the spirit of excitement to the game of cricket, which is expected in the game of cricket, and they're doing it bravely. And the person who says in line four, something badly amiss. The word amiss there that something is wrong. Okay, now there are two different figures of speech there that the person uses to enhance your understanding of the situation there in stanza one. Okay, so we have here in red, England boycotting excitement bravely. That's an example of sarcasm. Now, the definition of sarcasm is to appraise something or someone with the, with the intention of this praising them. Okay, so basically you mean the, the opposite of what you are saying, right? Which is um, a form of, which is actually um, verbal irony. Right. So notice that the person is saying that England is actually deliberately with Helen the spirit of excitement, which comes with cricket and they're doing it bravely. Right. So it's not as, it's not as if the person is actually commending the English team. He is really criticizing and mocking them for their poor performance. OK. And in line four says something bad I missed. I told you the word I missed there is. Um, Oh, it means that something, sorry, that something is wrong, right? And uh, these two lines also bring out, the two, these two words, boycott and amiss, are also an example of a pun. A pun is actually a figure of speech, a figurative device. It is actually the amusing use of words that have the same song, but different meanings, right? And usually when they are used, or whenever somebody uses them, it's really to emphasize, um, their meaning, okay, their meaning has something of importance. So in this case, boycott, the word boycotting, boycotting, and the word amiss, in badly amiss, they are actually the surnames of two um, England opening batsmen. So basically what the person is saying that the game, something is really wrong here, and it is because boycott is playing and amiss is playing. This is why something is wrong, okay? So that's the end of stanza one. Now stanza two says, Cricket, not the game they play at Lords. So the person establishes what is being played there at Sabina Park, and it is the game of cricket. And notice that the person makes a stunning, well, to him, observation. He said, not the game they play at Lords. He therefore establishes uh, an, a contrast between what he was witnessing and what occurs at Lords. Lords is actually a famous cricket ground in England. OK, so he's basically saying, well, something is happening here that doesn't happen in England. Right. And notice he said the crowd, whoever saw a crowd at a cricket match. So he's telling us and all these are examples of visual imagery. OK, so the person that tells us that um, true contrast, that there's usually not a crowd at Lord's and where he is at the moment at Sabina Park, there's a crowd there. When the person asks whoever saw a crowd at a cricket match, I wondered exactly what happens in England, but I mean, from watching cricket from around the world on TV growing up, there's, there's usually a crowd, you know, except when they have those, um, those long matches that go on for days sometimes, but generally, you know, it usually draws a crowd. But it's, you know, it's surprising that the person is saying that, by even saying that whoever saw a crowd at a cricket match, it gives us the, impre the impression or it suggests that a crowd is usually not at Lord's, at the cricket match in Lords, wherever they're having it, right? And this is also an example of a rhetorical question, which is a poetic device. It is not a figurative device, it is a poetic device. And usually when a rhetorical question is asked, a rhetorical question forces the, its listener or the listeners to think deeply about the question that is being asked. And we all know that a rhetorical question, um, well, it's a question that is asked, and in that question lies an answer. Okay, so when the person says, ask, whoever saw a crowd at a cricket match, we know that he's not expecting us to answer, right? It suggests to us that a crowd is there in Sabina Park. And the person also gives us a bit more information as it relates to the description of uh, what was occurring in Sabina Park. He, uh, he says that the crowd, right, notice that the crowd, the 
after the word crowd, there's a dash there, right? They're just giving us additional information about the crowd, and that information there is whoever saw a crowd at a cricket match. That interruption there is to just tell us about the um, persona's um, other thoughts or interruptive thoughts. So the persona says that the, the crowd are caged, vociferous partisans quick to take offense. Okay, so the word cage there suggests that the playing field actually had barricade, right? Um, which barricade the, barricaded the supporters from the players, the field from the pavilion. And they're saying that behind this cage or behind this cage or barricade, we find we, we, we could have seen vociferous partisans, right? Somebody who is described as vociferous, they're saying that they are loud right they're, they're really loud in in their behavior and the things that they're saying and a partisan is somebody who is um, a supporter of a team not just any supporter but a strong supporter so if the person is telling us that um the crowd are caged vociferous partisans is basically telling us that something was really wrong at sabina park during the game to the extent that the crowd was outraged they were upset they were frustrated something was wrong and notice who, were talk, who, who was actually upset, the vociferous partisans, okay? These are the supporters of the West Indies team. They were really frustrated and upset at the way in which the game was being played, and they did it loudly. The use of the word partisans also tells us a, a bit more about what the persona thought or things about the supporters, right? To call somebody a partisan is one thing to say, okay, she supports a particular party or a particular team, right? But when you call somebody a partisan, you're implying that person is biased, that they cannot not be objective. You know, they are blinded by their allegiances or their allegiance to that particular team. So when the person says arcade versus partisan, it means that they're quick to take offense. Every little thing, they're upset. They're there probably shouting at the players. And we were about to see what happened to the person as well. Okay? So quick to take offense tells us that the partisans, the person says that the partisans, partisans actually got upset easily. Right? Well, he thought they got upset easily. Right? I have here on our right hand side some um, poetic devices from stanza two. Okay, and all I did all of that, um, their effectiveness, I discussed their effectiveness while I give you that line by line analysis. Okay, let's move on to stanza three. Now stanza three reads, England 68 for none at lunch. What sort of batting that man? Them can't play cricket again? Perhaps them should have borrowed Lawrence Rowe. Now, in stanza three, the person observed that um, the, the game is actually crawling, right? It suggests that at lunchtime, the score should have been better, right? It should have been so much better that somebody decided to speak. And notice the use of the of dialogue here, right? You see the open quotation there, right? And um, somebody's actually speaking. That's what that means. So the person says, and the person is now speaking to the persona, right? And the person is that the white man who actually walked in the um, pavilion. The, that's who I'm referring to as the persona. So the West Indian supporter now directs a question to the persona. And the person asks another example of rhetorical question. What sort of batting that man? Which suggests to us clearly that the, the English team were batting and they were performing poorly. So what's that about in that man? Them can't play cricket again, right? Remember what I said about rhetorical question? It is not the case that the person really wanted an, wanted an answer. It shows the person's impatience with the poor performance of the cricketers, and it also shows their frustration, right? The person said, like, they can't play cricket again. Perhaps them should have borrowed Lawrence Rowe. Okay, now Lawrence Rowe, this is an example of a reference, not an allusion. I know sometimes I hear persons saying that this is an illusion. And the difference between an illusion and a reference is that an illusion is an indirect uh, reference or an indirect statement about something that was done in the past. Past. It can even be about something. It can be about a literature. It can be about music. Something that occurred or existed in the past. But a reference, uh, when a reference is used, it is direct. There's no indirect way about it. There's no beating around the bush. So in this case, the person wants to show that apparently the English team batting 
is terrible. So it's not a case that this thing they should have borrowed one of our batsmen. The person, the, the West Indian supporter came out plainly and clearly and directly and the, pest, and the supporter called the name. He called whose name? Lawrence Rowe. This is why this is a reference and not an illusion. Okay, so Lawrence Rowe is actually um, West Indies hard hitting batsman, right? We know it's for, I remember growing up, we heard about um, Ambrose and um, Laura, Laura and some others and um, Courtney and some others, you know, they were the most popular, well at the time, during my time, batsman at that time, okay? And I'm talking about West Indies cricketers or players. Right, so the person referenced Lauren Rowe to say that you know what, all I need some help. All I could have borrowed one with man, man. If it's so terrible, y'all were coming to play. Right, if y'all want some improvement, come and borrow somebody, you know, to do a bit better than what y'all are doing on the field at the moment. So, um, we have two examples of poetic devices here. One is actually use of dialogue, as I pointed out here. Um, the use of dialogue and also rhetorical question. I didn't want to add rhetorical question because I would have given you that before, but in explaining dialogue, I will tell you this much. Um, when the person asks, um, what kind of bat in that man, okay? When, when you allow characters or persons to speak, whether it's a poem or a sh short story, right? Um, the person's choice of words in this case helps us to understand what even caused the person to speak to begin with. We can actually hear the, the speaker's frustration and, and disappointment in the poor performance of the British team. Okay, that's, that's how effective the use of dialogue is. And even the question, the rhetorical question, what's that about in the man? It shows that he's really frustrated. Okay, and even though we know in stanza four, we'll see the person responding and so on, right? It really shows us the West Indian supporters impatient and frustration at what he was witnessing. Okay, a terrible match. Okay, let's move on. Now stands a four. <clears throat> and on it goes, the wicked slow as the batting and the crowd restless. So the wicked slow as the batting is, a, is an example of a stimuli, which is a poetic device and a figurative device. Okay, so this is how terrible and how slow the game was. The wicked was slow, the batting was slow. So when, when, I, when the wicked, would say that the wicked is slow, it suggests that even the people them who is bowling the ball, for, towards the cricketers, they're not hitting the wicket either, okay? And even the batting, and by batting, they're referring to the English team. So it seems even at this case, this observation by the persona is um, probably a fair one, I would say, because, you know, by saying the wicked slow, suggests that um, nobody's being out, nobody's being, um, uh, nobody's, nobody's going anywhere, basically, okay? Right, so, and on it goes, the wicked slow as the batting. That's an example of simile. And the crowd restless. The crowd became restless because they would have played so much money. And some persons, I know, some persons when they hear sports generally, whether football, cricket, netball, you know, these sports persons, when they go to matches like these, they, they want to have a good time. They don't want to be bored. You know, that's why sometimes when you're looking at these matches on TV, or even when they're advertising, you know, especially when they advertise an upcoming game, they tend to show you excitement because when they're advertising these games, they show you with one, they see the game is partisan, people getting on and so on. People come with, excite, with, with the expectation to have fun. But clearly this is not happening, right? So the crowd becomes restless. And then um, the, pers the, the West Indian supporter speaks again. There are some persons who tend to say that this is a second speaker right but the fact that the speaker this is a west indian speaker directs um his or, his or her question to the persona by using the word a white boy eh it suggests there's a continuation in in a conversation or something that was said before right there's some persons who are saying that this is a second um west indian speaker but the use of the word a white boy you know as if you are saying eh like you didn't hear me before, or let me ask you a second question, okay? So a white boy, how your brothers then does sell we send we sleep so? And the word brothers them, he, he basically is saying, brothers, you come, you came in, clearly you are supporting the English team, you all are all one, therefore you are brothers, okay? And he asked, the West Indian supporter asked the persona, may I pay money to watch this chupiness? Another rhetorical question which shows frustration and so on. And then he said, cho. Cho is actually an expression of disgust. Okay, and also we have 
Another example, of, we have an example similarly. I think this is the only one there in the poem. The use of direct quotation. Um, the, the use of direct quotation. That's um, a white boy. There's one in the stanzas, stanza above as well. And also, uh, it is used insultingly to complain about the bold performance of the English batsman and the use of the exclamation mark right here with the word "chew," an expression of disgust to show how sickening they are, you know, about the poor performance of the um, the cricket match or the poor performance of the cricketers. Okay, that's stanza four. Now let's move on to stanza five. So stanza five says. So I try to explain in my Hampshire drawl. Hampshire is actually uh, a, a county in England and the word drawl means accent. So after the West Indian supporter um, complained about the poor performance of the British team, the persona now feels obligated to make excuses for the players. And notice that he makes his, these excuses in his Hampshire drawl. You know, he started talking in dicks as we will see in the Caribbean. You know, he now decides to speak to the um the west indian supporters um in a way where the supporter can hear that he has an accent and even by using the accent is it is the person as we are trying to convince or win over the west indian supporter okay so the person says so i try to explain in my hampshire draw so i try to explain in my hampshire accent about conditions in kent kent is also a county in england as well so these are the excuses, conditions in Kent about sticky wickets and even muggy days. Okay. Now, sticky wicket is an example of um, tactile imagery because it appeals to your sense of touch. Okay. And when we talk about muggy days, it's basically those, you know, rainy season and monsoon season, uh, you know, is really damp, rainy weather, right? That usually occurs mainly in South Asia. So... The person is says, you know what, this, these are the reasons why they're playing the way they're playing. So the person is saying conditions in Kent. It's as if, you know, the, 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 playing feeling where, the playing fields where they practice, they were damp. They were not appropriate for them to um, practice. Hence their performance at the moment. Okay. Now let's talk about sticky wickets. And I said that sticky wicket is an example of visual imagery and visual Im and imagery in itself is a poetic device. It is not a figure, a figure of speech. Okay, it's a poetic device. Now, um, sticky wicket is, is a tactile imagery because, as I said before, it it's, uh, appeals to your sense of touch. It's sticky because it presents an aqua situation. So what's happening here is that when you look at the stump, the cricket stump, right, there are usually some going up, upwards and to the top, you will find like two small ones, right? So if the ball hits the, the stump, they will all fall apart. But because nobody um, is being out, nobody is going anywhere. The, the the sticks are in place. They are not being um they are not being removed in any way. They are described as being sticky, right? They are not doing what is expected to be done at some point during a cricket match, right? And when you consider when you you consider the word sticky, like for example, if you place glue on your hand, right? Uh, especially paper glue eventually it become tacky and sticky and you know eventually you will try your best to try to peel it off and get it off your skin it's like actually mashing like for me i hate to mash rice grain you know the, the stickiness on their foot just for me i will go and wash my feet because it's uncomfortable and i just want to do something about it whenever i'm placing those sticky conduct um situations so by saying sticky wicket it shows how uncomfortable the conversation was not just for the persona but to hear a west indian supporter blaming him for his brother's performance for the perform the poor performance of the british team i mean after all you came in you know actually strutting in because you want everybody to know that that's your team you expect that you know they, they actually found a way to channel their frustration Okay, so it became uncomfortable, you know, even in making those excuses and even while he's been asked these rhetorical questions about the way in which the English team is playing. And notice too that the person is actually blaming muggy days and monsoon season, right, in Manchester. Now, Manchester doesn't experience monsoon season as badly as what occurs in South Asia, right? And even after the person was making these excuses, he admits here in the last in the last line, the person says, but fail to convince even myself. 
So that he, for example, he's there making so many excuses. Oh, this is why. And then after he really thought about it, he realized that, you know what? If, if I were you, I would not even believe me because I'm not even convinced that these excuses that I'm giving you, that they're really truthful. Okay? So I have pointed out, we have tactile imagery, right? And there's an example of auditory imagery. Auditory imagery there is on the British speaker's accent, right? The Hampshire drawl. Even though you haven't heard it, I am quite certain you would have heard a British accent at some point. So when the person says, so I try to explain in my Hampshire drawl, right? It appeals to your sense of hearing and it therefore um, causes you to uh, listen to the excuses, the different excuses that the person is using in his British accent, okay? Now stanza six. The crowd's loud busing drives me out, skulking behind a tarnished rosette, somewhat frayed now, but unable quite to, ex to conceal a blushing nationality. So the, basically what the person is saying here in stanza six is that the crowd loves busing drives me out, right? Busing there is actually uh, abusing as if he's been verbally abused. Notice that the A is in there and the use here of the of the the use oh, of the apostrophe suggests that a letter was omitted there. In this case, is the word A. So he's basically saying that the crowd recognizing by his skin color that he's supporting the British team, they are now um, verbally abusing him. He's referring to the questions that were asked, um, the rhetorical question about the poor performance, how they're actually coming to him to speak, on, speak for and on behalf of the English team. So he considers what they're telling him and what they're saying to him as an abuse and it's loud. And notice that he's saying that this is the cause, because of this, it's drive him out. Out where? We'll see that he's the, he will eventually crawl out of the of Sabina Park. Okay? So he's saying that this is the reason why um, he's leaving. Notice the way in which he's leaving, he's skulking. When you skulk, you're moving how? You are moving in a way. I, 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 see, you're secretly moving I, in a way um, so you won't be noticed by every, everyone. This is a stark contrast to the way in which the person entered uh, in stanza one and in stanza six, which is the last stanza in stanza one. He called he enters Sabina Park. The person said that he strut. When you strut, you walk proudly. But notice the way in which he's leaving, he's skulking, right? He's hiding or he's moving about secretly trying not to be noticed. And notice that he's skulking and moving secretly. Where? Behind a tarnished rosette. Remember, too, this is another example of contrast. Um, he said that he had the rosette of his skin. You know, he proudly wore it and so on. But notice that the rosette now is now tarnished. It is not worn. It is now bruised in comparison to the, the way in which he described his rosette at the beginning. Tarnished rosette there suggests that he's now embarrassed for his team. You know, this rosette which he, he was so proudly wearing, it is now tarnished, right? Um, not physically, but metaphorically. So tarnished rosette is an example of a metaphor because it shows his embarrassment. It shows that his pride has been hurt. It shows that he's now ashamed of the team, the England team. And notice that he said that it's somewhat frayed, right? Somewhat frayed means that it is now loose. It is now worn now but unable quite to conceal a blushing nationality. So it's basically blushing there. Nationality is another example of a metaphor, right? The, the idea is because he's so flustered and he's so embarrassed that it can be seen um, on his skin. The very skin that he call a rosette, it is quite obvious that he's so embarrassed. It's there written all over his face, even his body language, everything about him now. So because of that, he's now secretly easing out of Sabina Park, and he's trying to do that in a secret way because he's no longer proud to, to be called English. <laughs> or he's, he, no, he no longer wants to be seen around what is happening there. Because, I mean, obviously, the West Indian supporters, they are blaming him. You came in proudly. Your team, your team is actually playing bad. You have to answer for them. Okay? So, we have seen here in stanza six, example of imagery. <clears throat> and it's always important, once you are... Uh, answering a question on imagery, you must identify the type of imagery. 
So in stanza six and in the previous stanzas where I have given you examples of imagery, notice that I was very specific, right? So in stanza six, notice that I said visual imagery. CXC tends to take away a mark when you adjust the imagery. What do you mean? It, um, um, what kind of imagery, right? They want you to say the type of imagery and also never just write visual. It can be visual aid, visual ads. It's called visual imagery. Okay, I know CXC from experience, they would tell markers to, you know, yeah, uh, even teachers, you know, just speak to the students and, you know, let them write, um, let them write properly. Let them identify the imagery. Okay. All right. So these are the themes, the tone and the mood in the poem. Okay. So in this poem, there are um, theme of sports because we know it's cricket, conflicts and complications. The conflict is there and the complication there, you know, between the players and the different conflict there, um, people and desires, right? The desire of the person to be seen as he enters the pavilion. We can see, you know, um, the desire of the West Indian supporters, to, you know, to actually come and witness an exciting, an exciting game of cricket, right? And also places, um, the cricket is taking place, uh, the, the, the game of cricket is being played at Sabina Park. There's discrimination, there's culture, okay? And the, where the tone is concerned, when we talk about the tone, it's actually the attitude of the person towards the subject, and not just the person, um, because we had more than one speakers, or we have more than one speakers in the poem. We have the West Indian supporter, right? When we read stanza one, we realized he was proud and so on. We had frustration and and disappointment, even in the 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 words used by the West Indian supporters, right? And we we even detect elements of scorn as well. So the tone changes depending on the speaker and what is happening at the moment, right? And even embarrassment, because even the latter stanzas, we realize that the person now became embarrassed. He even admit that, you know, I can't even convince myself. I don't even believe the excuses I'm, I'm making. And he was so embarrassed, I noticed that he actually skulked out of Sabina Park. He moved out secretly and he left, okay? And when we talk about the mood, the mood refers to how the reader feels as a result of reading, as a result of the writers, or the, in this case, the persona's choice of words, okay? So there are elements of feeling tense there, right? Tense, especially with the, um, that confrontation with the West Indian supporter and the, the English, um, the persona. There's a sense of hopefulness as the persona enters, right? And also embarrassment. Okay, if you can think of any more, feel free to share it in the comment section and we will discuss it. Okay. Okay, so this is just an overview of the poem. So, um, the confident English persona walks proudly into Sabina Park to watch a cricket match, but soon realizes that something is wrong. Then the person is not accustomed to expressive crowd, which complains about the English team's powerful performance. The person attempts to make excuses for the English team, but could not even convince himself. And finally, the person became embarrassed and sneaked out of the park. Okay, so thank you for listening and feel free to share your reflections um, of the poem and like, comment, subscribe to my channel until we meet again. Take care.